Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Adrian D'Souza of Damned Designs. Dam Designs makes pry bars, fidget spinners, nucks, and lanyard beads, but it's most known for its stylish and useful folding knives. I recently had four Dam Design knives on loan for review and realized that they were the first high value knives that genuinely appealed to me in a long time. And I had a very difficult time boxing them up and sending them along. Uh, when my time was up with them. The Knives Adrian designs are unique and even audacious, but they're not weird, and they are always functional first. Appearing in small batches at prices most can afford, Adrian seems to have a long-term strategy for bringing his knives to market, and I'm looking forward to finding out all about it. But first, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you can't finish this episode in video form, remember to download it to your favorite podcast app. That way you can listen to it uh, during your found time, when you're driving, doing the dishes, mowing the lawn, etc. And if you think what we do here is valuable and you want to help support the show while enjoying extras like interview extras, knife giveaways, stickers, early access to the show, and more, you can do so on Patreon. Quickest way to do that is to head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. Adrian, welcome to the show. Thanks, Bob. How's it going? Oh, it's going great. It's going great. It's a pleasure to have you here. And I'm also really happy that uh, I, I have the recent memory of four of your designs uh, that we were just talking about before, um, fresh in my memory <clears throat> uh, as we as we go into this conversation. Uh, um, my initial or my, my impressions, not knowing you at all, and just only ha have it only having read what I read off your website, right. I got the feeling that you yourself uh, are, are, are a serious knife fanatic or a knife lover, just from how it was, how all four of those models were designed. Uh, are you a knife nut? And how did you get into this thing? Uh, to be honest with you, I, my journey in the knife world has been fairly uh, recent. I'm a, I'm a fairly newcomer to the... and. Um, this is mainly because I've lived in countries where I couldn't own or carry knives. Uh, I was born in Kuwait, and then I grew up in India, and then I, I moved to Kuwait for work in 2008. And uh, being a fairly restrictive country, I couldn't really ha get a lot of knives in. Um, but I was always, uh, let's say, enamored by knives. I used to look at custom-made knives on Instagram and really drool over them. And um, when I started my business in 2017, I knew somewhere down the line that I want to make and design knives. Um, so that my journey in, like I said, in the knife world has been fairly, um, I'm fairly fresh to the community, but now I'm in it. I'm, uh, I think I've immersed myself in it quite, quite well. So, yeah. It sounds like the kernel was always there, but your uh, external circumstances just kind of, uh, kind of uh, stopped you from, from fully diving in until you got to the right place. Right, that's right. So you, uh, you said you started Dam Designs, uh, your company, in 2017. What that's did you right. start it? Uh, uh, what did you start it on the back of? What was your first main product? I was doing fidget spinners. Oh. Right. So I started doing fidget spinners. My first design was in June 2017, um, and I've done maybe over 50 designs since. I still do them. Uh, I still do fidget spinners, but that was my primary business for the longest time. How how did the fidget spinner thing? Um, okay, so fidget spinners got gigantic. I mean, to the point where they were just giving them away at stores. You know, the real cheap ones, obviously, right. not not yeah. the damn designs ones. But right. uh, it really tapped into something way more universal. And I was under the impression that fidget spinners came out of the knife world because of this love of action and ball bearings and pivots and stuff like that. Do you right. know if that's true? And and what was it like? Uh, you know, how, how's the fidget spinner business? So to be honest with you, I don't know if it came out of the knife world, but it was um, it was designed by Scott McCloskey, who runs MD Engineering. And this was much before the so the boom happened in February 2017. And 
I, I started first seeing spinners in uh, about six months before that. So that's when I think Scott used to make custom spinners for people. He had books. He would do different configurations. And it was more of part of the EDC community. I'm not sure if his motivation came from, from knives. I don't know if he's a knife guy, uh, to be honest with you. But that's... It's definitely it definitely wasn't for the ADD and ADHD kids as, as right. all the news articles made it out to be. Right. Sure, it helps. It it's, it has helped a lot of people. A lot of my customers, you know, suffer from anxiety or um, other disorders that they find fidget products really help them with. Um, I started my business after the boom, so I used to sell. Mm -hmm. Uh, fidget spinners in Kuwait just buy from factories and other people and sell them and then I got stuck with a lot of inventory as like you said they were available in stores and everywhere for pennies um, and then I started designing my own but this was after the after the boom really uh, but it has been good um, my customers love my products the my aesthetic appeals to a lot of people so I have collectors who've been buying products from me since 2017 and now they're still buying knives and other adc products uh, so yeah fidget spinner the business was good but i'm i'm phasing that out now yeah yeah i could see uh, you know it, i i hadn't actually thought of this until right now but i'm always kind of talking about my theory of art and design because a lot of people will say you know oh, that knife is a work of art and 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 i will start to split hairs and i will say though it is a very beautiful well-designed you know perfectly engineered and, and working knife it is not a work of art because it can be used for something other than appreciating and contemplating that's what art is right. for you hang it on the wall and you think about it you look at it and come back to right. it it's like uh fidget spinners are kind of more like art than knives in a way because they really kind of serve no other purpose but the tactile and visual enjoyment right yeah, I agree with you. But even when it comes to knives, I think you can classify them as functional art, right? Um, I mean, yeah, art is art is very subjective. So yeah, some people might look at something, hang it on a wall, but others could very possibly use something and still think it's it's art. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, oh, excuse me. I have these very rigid rules I set up for myself. <laughs> I don't know why, like, uh, but uh, that's one of them. It can't, it can't be used, or it's not like <laughs> like it matters. So, um, so tell me about designing your first knife, taking that step. Obviously, you're an EDC um, guy, and for, you know, in other words, you like the tools uh, that people carry for everyday use. Um, right. How did it – tell me what it was like designing your first knife and what your goals were with that first knife. So to be honest with you, when I first, when I designed my first knife, I ha I didn't have a lot of knives. I had a Kershaw – I don't know what it was. Um, I forget what it's called. Something 2, maybe the Launch 2. I don't remember. Uh, I bought it in a store in Kuwait, and um, I didn't really know a lot about, you know, all the different locking mechanisms and everything that went into a knife. I have a friend called Vahit. He's Turkish. He runs uh, Bade Modern Designs. Um, he did the Pocket Rhino, and he's most. Mm -hmm. uh, he recently did the Stunner knife. I'm not sure if you've seen it. It was on Kickstarter. Uh, so he really helped me out with my first design, and uh, you know, helped me understand all the aspects of what goes into a knife, etc. And um, yeah, I designed my first knife called the Wendigo that I prototyped. Tuya was the company that prototyped it. And um, I got it out to the reviewers. It was really, it was a polarizing design because it was a modified Tanto. It wasn't for everyone. So I remember, I think it was Eugene Kwan who said it was like, he gave it a pretty, pretty bad review. <laughs> uh, but some others really enjoyed the knife. And when I first posted, I so I designed four knives at the same time. Uh, one of them is unreleased. The second one was the Wraith, which was my first production model, and um, the Wendigo, and then one other one. And when I posted them on Facebook groups, the the Wraith, which was a sheep's foot, got the most attention. Mm. So I was like, you know what, I'm not going to release this um, this polarizing design, and instead I'll go with something that seems a lot more popular. So I released the, the Wraith. 
but then uh, some other people in the community, like my friend Mark Grayscale Carry on Instagram, he said that the Wendigo is his favorite of my designs and that I should really release it. So I, I most rec- I released it recently. I redesigned it a little bit and uh, and released it. Yeah, that was. Uh, I noticed that you uh, you redesigned the um, you have uh, what it was one of the four that I had. Uh, it wasn't the Cerberus. Uh, it was the Hades. You redesigned the Hades a little bit, didn't you? That's right. You yeah. took that very long point and and altered so, that. What what was behind that design choice? So what happened is uh, here I have the I don't know if you've seen this one. This is the Ooh. the titanium version of the of the Hades. So the problem with the Hades and the Fenrir were, was that they had different handles, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, most of my other knives share handles. So the Yokai, Basilisk, and the Cerberus, for example, share the same handles. And the Banshee, Wendigo, and the Invictus set share the same handles. And also this, this new model that's, um, that's a Kaiser prototype. Mm-hmm. These share the same handles. So the idea is to make new scales and have them, you know, easily uh, accessible to people to to switch out the scales and customize their knives. The problem is that the minimums in factories and uh, that I work with are really high. And it's, uh, it's, I found it quite difficult if I had to release the Fenrir and the Hades as they were as two separate knives, then making scales for them would have been a challenge. So what I did was also the Fenrir, if you notice, had a very weird clip. It it went like this on the sides. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, it was right. Yeah. The one clip that was yeah. different. <clears throat> yeah. So what I did was I modified the handles a little bit on the Fenrir to make the clip straight. And then I just fit the Hades blade into the same handle. So, you know, I could do scales in the long run. Yeah, that was the okay. plan. Okay. So that... that... That makes sense because uh, with those four knives, as I as I mentioned, I felt like the the Fenrir and the and and the Hades had similar handles, uh, but uh, I was I was sure that the Invictus and the Cerberus had the same handle, uh, right? No, 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 no. Uh, no. Um, okay, all right. Anyway, there was a similarity between them that there's seemed- a similarity. Yeah. That 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 seemed to um, be both uh, like efficient for what you're saying in terms of production. You can right. kind of mix and match in terms of handle scales and things uh, like that. But also, um, you know, it's sort of sticking with this sort of uh, um, uh, ergonomic quality that they all seem to have. They're all very hand filling, but not too big. Um, right. Z- so what with that first knife, it, it, the first three knives you were talking about, the Wendigo um, and and others, they're a little bit smaller, right, than the ones yeah. that you've come so, out with later. So tell me right. about that. So, so I'll show you this. This was one of my – this was actually my second or third knife. I first did the Wraith, which was a sheep's foot, and then I did this one, which is the Basilisk and also the Yokai. So these – initially was smaller and if you look at this the yokai which is the same same knife i'm not sure if you can see them uh very well but you can see the difference in size now the reason for this is i first designed these knives based on what i thought the community liked or someone like nick shabazz for example Mm -hmm. uh just watching reviews etc figured that people liked smaller and thinner knives with thinner blade stock because i had spoken to nick on Instagram, and he said he likes, you know, thin blade stock. And then I went out to Blade Blade West in 2019, and I saw some of Artisan's knives and some of the knives out there. And I was like, these knives are big. Why have I gone? I'm I'm a fairly big guy. I'm six feet three, uh-huh. and I was like, why have I built? Why have I made these small knives? So I scaled them up a little bit, and. Um, even back then, even at Blade Show West in 2019, people, a lot of people said that they felt like the knives were designed for their hands and that the uh, ergonomics were quite good. So I scaled it up a bit and tested it, and yeah, this is. Uh, I think this is this is this fits my hand perfectly. Mm. So that was the that was the design choice to scale it up a bit, about 10, 10 15 percent. 
So I was uh, surprised up front when you said that you, you, you know, didn't have a background in knives, that it was something that, you know, was kind of always in you, but due to the circumstances, uh, you didn't develop it because uh, my first thought when I got those four knives, um, and then from what I've heard from other people with the other designs is like, yeah, this right. is, this is obviously the work of a knife guy because the action is awesome. They look great. They feel great. That super wide chamfer makes the makes the whole handle almost seem contoured you know right. um instead of faceted or or whatever you know there are so many the 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 um the concentric hexagons for the pivot uh right. everything about that knife uh, all those four knives seemed very considered even down to like well no all of them are flippers but this one this one really should be a thumb stud knife you know uh with the, right. with the hades um, so yeah, I mean, it really seems like you picked up on a lot of, of what the state of the art was, uh, in knives. Right. So when I look at a product, I think about how I can make it better. And this is not just knives, right? Just in my day to day life. Um, I think about how I can add value to a product. And when I was designing knives, I did exactly that. So for example, nested liners, I don't know why anyone I don't know why others don't do it because <laughs> visible liner locks are ugly to me and um, minimal hardware. You know, I knew what I wanted to do with the clip, the the screw that holds the clip also needs to, that needs to be the only, only screw in the back. And the hexagon has kind of been my, it's been one of the elements I've been using since the, the since the very start, my old logo was actually a hexagon. Oh. Um so that is something that I incorporate in my designs and yeah, just best practices. What I personally think should be what's, what's ideal in a knife. Uh, that's all I implemented. And I'm glad that it resonates with, uh, with people. Oh yeah. And, and now, right now I'm thinking of the Cerberus when I say this, but, uh, that, that is a, uh, you know, it's not a, a shrinking violet. It, it is a, it's a big, bold, robust knife. It's got a somewhat thick blade stock, but the damn right. blade is so wide, you know, right. that that by the time you get to the edge, it's Damn. so thin and slicey. I mean, that knife is really yeah. cool. It's a very, you. uh, very, you're welcome. Very cool knife. Um, and, and so I've noticed, and I'm sure many people have, and then I read something in uh, knife news to this effect, but, uh, you've, you've come out with some very high end knives with high end materials obviously your design and then you've taken your design i which is why people go to your stuff in the first place and you've given people a high value option with d2 and nested liners in g10 instead of titanium and and you know um to me like uh, i i almost feel like never having handled one of your premium ones like that the d2 g10 i was like wow i didn't know i liked d2 g10 anymore like but right and that sounds snobby, but you know how your own tastes develop yeah. and you kind of go down yeah, alleys course. and stuff. Um, so you you have these two modes, you know, the high end and then the high value. Um, right. How do you decide what you're going to do or tell me the strategy behind that? So a bit of history about how I got into knives and um, the timeline of events. Uh, when I first released my my first knife and the subsequent, subsequent two, I was coming to Blade West in... Uh, in Portland and I needed knives. So what I did was I thought I'll go top of the line. So I did titanium with M390 or the rate was also available in the marble carbon fiber or my carta with M390. And as you can see, this one had uh, Mokutai inserts. Mm. So I, I priced them at about $225, not the Mokutai inserts, but the reg, the carbon fiber inserts with the titanium and M390 frame locks were about $225. And I struggled to sell them. And what I realized was that people don't give give chance to a new brand at that price point. You know, no one's going to come out and spend $225 on a knife that they may or may not like because it's expensive. And my, the, the next knife I released was the Oni, which is a, a mini, a fifth pocket knife, a front flipper. And I had the $40 version, which is the D2 G10. And then I had the $100 S35VN with titanium. And what I noticed was that people were consistently buying the $40 knives, right? Where, whereas I had 
I had the titanium M390 knives in stock for almost two years. And mm. I'd only made 50 of these models. Imagine I couldn't sell 50 of the 50 of these knives over two years and I had to eventually sell them at cost. So I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to release my knives at a value price point, which is the $40, $50 mark. And this way people, I can get my designs out there and people can try them. And, you know, if they, if they get on board with the design and everything that I have to offer, I can then eventually do better steels and better materials for them. So that was the, that was the strategy. Um, then this year I released four, the four knives that you got, I released them together. And then the next four, I released them together. I design, I don't want to toot my own horn, but I do design a lot of stuff, even with fidget spinners. I could have stuck with one or two designs and done them in all different materials and this and that, like a lot of others do. No disrespect to any of them, but I just did over 50 fidget spinner designs. And now with knives, it's the same thing. I just like designing and I like doing a lot of uh, different options. And I've heard people say, for example, Metal Complex, which had had a review recently of four of the knives, and he said they are very similar. And that is true. If you look at the handles, they are quite similar. The chamfers, etc., they're quite um, recognizable as my designs. But not every blade shape is for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. So you may like the Cerberus because it's a clip point. Someone else may like the Yokai because it's a Tanto. Even in Tantos, I have a different type, a few different types of Tantos. Um, so yeah, that was the idea to release as many different designs as possible to appeal to a larger audience mm -hmm. and to kind of rope them into the brand. <clears throat> It seems like if you're going to do what you initially set out to do, which is come out with the high end knives in the $250, uh, you know, price category that in order to be successful to do that, if you're a brand new company, it almost seems like you have to market yourself in concert with whoever your OEM was. Like, if you like this design, Riot made it so you know it'll be good or, or, or something to that effect to get people to yeah. trust you. Um, yeah. Um, and 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 also like this this shift of strategy that that you took once you discovered oh it's been two years with the same fifty knives I need to change it up that seems like um, a real benefit of being a designer not a maker um, not someone who's tooled up to make titanium right. frame locks and then has to like learn how to do uh, liner locks or whatever it is you know you could just shift. Right gears with your design and have new right. new things made right yeah that is that is there but also i'm uh by profession i'm a i'm a merchandiser i, I was a fashion buyer with mm. with a clothing company american eagle apparel for eight years so i kind of know business as well you know other than being a designer so i knew what i had to do i knew i had to switch gears and do something different if things weren't moving and it was a risk obviously to fund you know, 1,200 knives out of pocket. I didn't do any pre-orders on those models. I funded them uh, with my own money in, in spite of having thousands of dollars stuck in knives that weren't moving. Yeah. But, you know, um, I've always had the support of um, a lot of reviewers, good friends of mine, like Big Red EDC, a Therapeutic Edge, Peter, Zach, you know. Mm. I always get support. They, they love the stuff I design, and they've always been supportive. So... I actually ran this idea past Peter and he was not too confident that it would work. But uh, he then turns around recently and told me, he was like, you made the wrong, you made the right choice, you know, and he, despite of me not being on board, it was a risk. I took it and ho luckily it paid out. And I must say this, my design is one aspect of it. I must also give credit to Kubi who, really killed it with production they did an amazing job with production so everything when you when it comes to ergos obviously that's design so on and so forth but when you talk about action that has to go you know hands down that that's what kubi has done and i have a great working relationship with them and i'm really glad that you know i found an oem that knows what they're doing and they do it really well so this, yeah. this combination is is good 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, if if the four specimens I had in in my possession are any indication, they were great. They were really, really good. And I was wondering who made them. Nat- naturally, I'm sure a lot of people do that. And yeah. uh, and now that you're telling me this, I think they're the first Kubis I've ever had. You know, Kubi made yeah. knives. Unless I've experienced other OEM knives that right. uh, I wasn't aware. It's it's interesting that you were in the fashion world. I do uh, video production uh, for yeah for my job and I've worked in the fashion industry uh, for about five years uh, producing and editing. I worked at a company that we covered the fashion world, all the major shows. And uh, I thought it was an interesting job. I I really liked it. Um, But something I I really pulled away from it that I see, I just noticed in the knife world and I was talking about it the other day on on another show was um, how in fashion, you go to a fashion show or you see fashion coming down the runway and most people think like, no one's going to wear that. That's crazy. You know, like uh, that's, you know, but then, but then two years later in the gap, you see that same color of Royal blue. You see that collar, you see elements from those runway shows trickle down into mainstream fashion. Right. Well, I was just at Lowe's, you know, hardware store the other day and, and bought a $20 Crescent Tools knife that had bearings. It had it boasted a deep carry pocket clip with an inset screws and it had uh, all of these features, you know, even uh, even on the flipper side, a little landing spot for your fingers had all these features that we come to right. expect in the knife world in a $20 knife. So it's that same fashion world sort of trickle right. down, thing. trickle down, right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so um, I'm interested about your um, inspirations. Okay. So every one of your knives has some sort of mythical beast or, or <laughs> element, elemental sort of thing tied to right. it. Um, where does that come from? What's what's the inspiration? It's just the branding. So when I, I'm, a, I'm huge on branding. I think branding is really important to build. Um, it's like the, the Marlboro marketing, right? Because they they did the lifestyle marketing, and it's not about it's not about selling the product; it's about selling a selling a lifestyle. So when I came up with the name Damn Designs, I thought it was cool, and then you know it took to stay in, on team with the branding with the damned branding. I just went with mythical mythical creatures. There's nothing nothing more than that. People, someone asked me if I was a Satanist. I'm not. <laughs> I, I was born Rome. I was born Catholic. I'm um, I was raised Catholic. I'm atheist now, agnostic maybe. But there's nothing more to it than that. It's just it's just cool, you know. Yeah, it's, it's better than having a. It's better than having some random numbers and and letters of the alphabet that. It doesn't make sense to anyone, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So. And there's a lot of cool imagery that comes with it. Um, uh, your new logo, for instance, you said your old, old logo was a hexagon. That's correct. Your new logo. What is it? I mean, I, I have looked at it closely and analyzed it, but what is it? So it's it's supposed to be like the, uh, like kind of like Baphomet. So it's, it's four knives that form the head of a, uh, the head of a goat demon. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's what that's what it's a minimal. It's a very minimal logo, so that's what it's supposed to be. But it's made of knives, so I, I think it's yeah, really it's, cool. it's it's a pretty cool logo. I gotta say, yeah, thank you. It is pretty cool. Yeah, it's four knives, so two folded and then two cross. Yeah. Well, I think I think it's interesting, like the whole idea of branding, um, and and the fact that you come to this from a different. Uh, sector of industry is right. interesting to me. I think of um, off, off, offhand, I mean, your products are, are pretty different, but uh, the James brand, you know, a couple of, I don't, one, one of them was a Nike designer and I know that their thing is about lifestyle and they have this whole kind of very slick branding ar- around everything. Right. Um, I think that's kind of a refreshing thing to see uh, in the knife world, uh, branding outside of the sort of, knife rolls that we usually see branding for right <laughs> so well, uh, yeah i mean i i really appreciate great design so look at kanye west for example he was what a rapper and a music producer and now he's got one of the biggest he's one of the richest people alive because he built a brand around sneakers and you know clothing so i definitely think that design skills are transferable um and yeah it is i think it is um it's good to see this different refresh of ideas 
in in any industry um so yeah well what do you see um in terms of the knives that you make the knives that you design and uh, so we're talking about kind of lifestyle and how they fit into a branded um range of products but in terms of the end user when you're designing a knife uh, besides how it will fit into that product range what are the kind of considerations you're you're taking into account so the, the blade shapes do what they do right i mean i i'm not created any new blade shapes all the blade shapes i've i have up basically tried and tested blade shapes that have been done for hundreds of years if not longer so i just i just do my variation of them or my my flavor with an existing you know knife design so a tanto will do what a tanto does uh good good for piercing etc draw point will do what a draw point does so i'm not reinventing the wheel really i'm just taking something adding my design style to it and releasing releasing it out there so someone who has need for a tanto has the option of buying my tanto and all the other tantos that's out there you know it comes down to it comes down to if they like the design if they like like the aesthetic if the price to uh, value ratio is good for them you know and and then the branding that's also an element that um, you know plays a role i think as as a, a singular force behind damn designs uh, you know, and, and, and the damn designs name and the company, how do you view competition? Like, uh, um, <clears throat> you know, the knife world has kind of really expanded. There, there are a lot of people buying knives. There are so many knife companies. There are a lot of, uh, I don't know if freelance is the right term, but kind of, uh, um, um, uh, un unaffiliated designers who, 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 you know, there's, it's just such a fertile thing happening right now in the knife world. <clears throat> right. Excuse me. Uh, how do you view yourself in terms of the playing field and, and, and in terms of competition, because you're a businessman that must be part of your thinking. Yeah. I mean, um, the, the competition exists everywhere. Right. Um, I think I've managed to make carve myself a small niche even despite the competition i think what separates me is that a i'm a single designer that puts out a lot of designs b i don't only do knives so i have edc products that are really popular i do fidget spinners i just finished a campaign for a fidget product for a multi-fidget that raised about forty eight thousand dollars on kickstarter wow so you know i have i think that i have three vert verticals i have the knives i have edc and then i have fidget and that is one of my strengths that i i do a wi wide range of products and i'm not only competing with on the knife front with people who make knives or only on the edc front with people who make edc or on the fidget side with people who make only fidgets i am in a fairly unique position that i have these three verticals and i design a lot of products across all of them and i think if someone likes two or three of these aspects they come to me and then they kind of stay with me because they know they can they can get almost everything they need from the same um at the same place if that makes any sense yeah it does and, and what's unique is that you're offering that uh, but you're not a huge operation most uh most companies that are diversified in that kind of way, making uh, fidget spinners, making EDC items like pry bars and, and other things are uh, a little bit bigger. You know, there are some some who do too, or but I mean, you're you're doing them all <laughs> and you're designing right. them all and you're just a, a, you know, you're not we knives, you know. Right. And right. Uh, so, yeah, uh, when I the second part to the uh, to the answer to your question is that yes I I can't possibly compete with a brand like We Knives for example simply because they have a wide range of designers that work for them mm -hmm. and I think eventually my designs will be my ideas will get saturated right I can't possibly design three hundred knife models without them being really similar to each other and 
that's not really my style. So what I was thinking of, this is something that I will do down the line is I was thinking of some sort of a launch pad where I can give new designers a chance and, and launch who, who have a great design that I can get behind. I can put my name behind, but they don't have the means to fund it, to get it produced and license designs out from them, similar to what big brands like we and best tech, et cetera, do. Um, without a lot of the bullshit sorry for no, I might have to beat that out. but you know i don't know if you know much about the uh, inner workings of the knife industry but it's quite it's quite a toxic place i've uh, i've spoken about it on my instagram very recently uh when someone asked me about how they can get into knife design um okay okay now i i have to ask you this this, <laughs> this begs the question because <clears throat> really almost without exception almost without exception i get people on this show telling me how amazing the knife industry is and how um forthcoming and generous most people are and, and all that this is actually the first time it's refreshing not that i like to hear bad news but it's refreshing right. to get a different and maybe uh, uh less uh, starry-eyed view of things how, l let me get it from your perspective right so um obviously i have I have my personal experience and this could be that because I wasn't or I'm still not a big name, not well known. Maybe that's why I was treated differently from other people who've been on your show and have had very pleasant experiences. And I'm, I, when I say bad experiences in a toxic place, I'm not talking about the community in general. There's some amazing people out there. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about more about factories that have concept, for example, I send them a design for OEM and we were on the final stages of finalizing everything and then they say oh my our factory boss is friends with another factory that makes your product so we can't accept your job because my boss doesn't want to upset his friend and i was like we are literally in the last last stages of you know me paying for for the uh, the deposit for the run which friend i i'm not working with any other factory at the moment and that was a bit of a shit show um a similar thing happened with best tech they were sitting on a prototype and then I asked questions about when they'd get ready. And this woman turned around and said, you know what? She basically asked me to piss off. Um, we concept, uh, not concept, artisan. I've sent them 10 emails about OEM, no replies. So this is the kind of, I mean, not necessarily very toxic, not all of it, but it's not, it's disheartening. And, you know, yeah. um, it's not, it's not, uh, people are, at least Chinese factories aren't very, very welcoming about, um, you know, uh, to new makers and new brands. And this wasn't even here, take my design, produce it. This was like, I want to get this knife produced. Can you do it for me? And um, yeah, just stuff like that. So even, I mean, I won't name him because he may not appreciate it, but someone who, uh, one of the knife designers, you may know him, uh, he's pretty um, popular. He best tech told him that he should he should stop designing and that his knife was horrible and that knife with another brand went up to be one of their best sellers and is uh <laughs> he's doing really well for himself so again i don't want to name him because that's okay. his story to tell and uh you know <clears throat> it's not mine but he's a good friend of mine and this is the kind of stuff that goes around and a lot of new new makers new designers talk to me and i'm very welcoming and very as helpful as i can be and uh, they tell me that they get they get pushed around a lot by, by wow. Chinese factories. Wow, wow, this is the first I'm hearing of any of this. <laughs> and I got to say, man, that's <clears throat> that's like, you know how someone gets too big for their britches and they start being a jerk. I mean, that's yeah, that, exactly. that's not that's not cool. I mean, yeah, they figure they've they've got the corner on the market over there in China because yeah. they can produce these things at the co cost we can't produce. Right. them here and but it's, um, it's not it's not only that there's another side to that story which is that there's a small city in fact in china that controls all the knife making and if you're not from that if you're, if you're not local to that city you will struggle even as a chinese person to get stuff done in that city it's like a it's like a knife mafia there it's crazy wow. there's there's so much happens behind the scenes <laughs> that people don't know about Probably <laughs> not the best idea to talk about it, but it's okay. well. You know what? That's what this. That's what this show is about. Well, um, it seems like uh, new operations are popping up over there, like kind of all the time. Like really, uh, who was I? Um, 
Oh, I was talking to Levon of the Knife Nuts podcast, and he, okay. and he referred to them as um, reviewer brands. <laughs> He's, uh, you know, brands that just kind of pop up and they get their knives in the hands of all, all of the the top, you know, twenty reviewers or whatever the number is, and kind of s- saturate the communication, uh, the airwaves with their knife, and 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 they come out with sixty million different models like like you know i i have a number of uh, companies i'm thinking of right now but you know i don't like you i don't need to single any of them out right. but it just in other words it seems like capacity is growing it seems like these companies that can just belt out knife after knife and they're super high quality those the numbers of those companies are just going up so it doesn't seem like people can afford to be that high-handed with you for that much longer and you're already an established guy yeah, I wouldn't say. I mean, I'm definitely gaining popularity, but yeah, I don't think I would say I'm established. Um, but yeah, I don't. I don't really follow the the market that closely to see what. There's a few few brands and few people I I follow mainly because a I don't want to be influenced by other people's aesthetic, mm-hmm. um, and b I really personally don't like a lot of uh, other design. I I think that's a horrible thing to say, but being being a product designer, you know, a lot of people's designs just don't appeal to me. There's a handful yes. of designers that I do really like and appreciate, and others that to me are just you know. Meh, okay, well, whatever. we don't we don't have to talk about the meh designers, but <laughs> exactly. who are the designers that excite you and and so, inspire you? Um, Arcane design. I I really like what mm-hmm. he's doing. His knives are definitely out there. Mm-hmm. Um, but the antimatter, which he did in collaboration with uh, something obscene, I bought it at Blade Show. It's easily one of my favorite knife designs. It's just so well done. I, I too have that knife and it's my it's one amazing. arcane. I love it. Yeah. I said I said I said this on Instagram. I was like, I low-key hate Israel for designing that. That's gonna really <laughs> be something something I designed because it's amazing. It's an amazing design. Uh, Dylan Mallory is a is a good designer, good friend of mine. I like what he does. Uh, Justin Lindquist, I like what he does. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll chat with him. Vero Engineering, though I haven't, oh, yeah. uh, I don't know them on a personal level. We have common friends. I like what they're doing. Um, yeah, those those are a few of the of the people I named. Then on the EDC front, there's Plague. I really like his aesthetic and what he does. There's there's a few. Worker Man does some really good oh, yeah. stuff. You know. Yeah, so I know Worker Man. I'm not familiar with Plague, but Plague does. Uh, yeah, he does the ghost bees that are really cool. His his aesthetic. So I love the aesthetic and people who have amazing Instagrams and you know, uh, so work a man plague. These these are a few brands I really really like and enjoy seeing seeing their work. Uh, we were just talking about OEMs uh, just a minute ago, and it occurs to me um, uh, about Millet. I'm thinking about Millet uh, because they're kind of the one really high end. No, I shouldn't say that. They're not the one, but they're the most. Um, I guess they're the premier high end OEM in the United States. Um, okay. And uh, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. They've they've done a lot of uh, they've done a lot of stuff uh, with. Well, a lot of cool OEM work, but uh, also um, TJ Schwartz and a number of other designers have done a lot of stuff through them, and uh, they're constantly kind of upping their game. And do you, as Damn Designs, do you ever? Um, this is this is a difficult thing being an OEM in the United States and making it uh, so that the product is affordable. You know, to try and follow that Chinese right. model, it's very difficult. But right. uh, is is that something that is important to you? Is that something that you would strive for um, in the future to try and? Uh, uh, you live in and work in the United States. Do you have any interest in trying to have your stuff built here, if pos if possible? So I uh, uh, I actually don't live and work in the United States, right? I oh. I came here I came here for Blade Show West. That's when I entered the country, and I leave next week. Oh, um, I thought you I'm were a, Wyoming I, and and uh, Pennsylvania. Yeah, the company is. Uh, I live in I'm in, in Pennsylvania right now at my friend's house. Oh. Uh, one of my best friends lives here, so I'm living with him. Uh, but I'm I'm basically a nomad now because. I used to have a job in Kuwait that I resigned from, and I was stuck in India since February 2020. I was supposed to come here to Blade Show Atlanta, but couldn't because Biden stopped the flights. And I finally went to Serbia, and then came went to LA, and then to San Fran, and now I'm in Pennsylvania. I've 
I flew out to Austin and I'm back now. I'm going to New York tomorrow. So I'm all over the place. And then I I travel a bit to Dubai and Kuwait, then back to India, maybe Thailand. So I'm basically a nomad now. Um, However, I... I do think that there is some merit to producing in America, but I'm not sure it is it is the right time. And I'll tell you why. Um, there's a company that I spoke to for producing my fixed blades. I I I, I designed two fixed, not designed, it's basically the yokai and the basilisk. I turned them into fixed blades because I don't have any. And I got pricing from the from an American manufacturer. And I put it on my Facebook group, which is about has about 1300 members. And I said, these knives. Nitro V, um, $250 for these um, fixed blades. And they're about four, four and a half inch blades. They are big. Um, Is anyone interested? And all but two people were interested. So, Mm. you know, if I can do the same product in China for 150, I know that number would have been a way, way higher than than two people you know yeah so i think i think i don't know whether i'm considered as the as the value brand and people expect to get you know a bargain when they come shop with me or if um if it's holiday season and you know finances are tight for most people because of christmas etc it could be there's many variables right um that i can't really figure out at this point of time but i i did try to do a fixed blade made in the u.s and it didn't really take off so i i went back to kubi and they're doing they're doing it now oh cool they're making, oh, they're making the fixed blade yeah it's however a... yeah however there's something i want to add yeah. uh being indian and you know i i come from india and um there's a couple um my one of my factory guys told me that labor labor rates in china are really increasing right now and in about three or four years china will lose its competitive edge hmm. when it comes to pricing now I don't know how how far that's true. You know I don't know. Only time will tell if that's actually the case. But what I did consider is putting up a machine shop in India, and uh, you know starting off maybe with my EDC and other stuff, and then eventually if I could do knives, uh, because India can easily match uh, China's you know labor rates, their yeah. uh, their material rates and India is not a communist country, so I cannot get. I cannot be. No one can come up to me and tell me, "Oh, you su- support communism." I've I've yeah. got comments like that before. So that is something that I'm <sighs> definitely. Um, I definitely have, you know, at the back of my mind that that yeah. that is something I may pursue down the line. Yeah, people give you that comment. They they write you that comment on their American-made iPhones, don't they? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you exactly. Know? I was like, literally everything you have is made outside the country, and they're like, oh no, but I have a choice to choose where my knife is made. Yeah, I, I get uh, it, but okay. you're supporting communism just as much as the next guy, if, you know? Yeah, if only your knives are made in the U.S. But yeah, you're supporting okay. it with your it's phone, just... not with your knives. <laughs> it's all good. Right. Um, yeah. so. You mentioned these fixed blade knives. Um, I'm I'm excited to hear that. And I, now that you mentioned it, I remember seeing the red handled uh, designs right. uh, of those. I, I I really like how they look. It they're both very um, not one to one, but they're really great interpretations of the folders. You know, sometimes people don't quite right. get that right, and uh, they they look awesome. So I'm a big fixed blade. Uh, I, I love fixed blades, and right. and um, so that, I'm looking forward to seeing that you were you were saying before you're not sure if you come off at or if the if the effort comes off as um, too 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 widespread or too spread too thin, uh, but I kind of don't think so. I think that uh, any designer or artist needs multiple projects going right. at once to to be able to to really work out the problems in all the other projects. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so, uh, for what, for what it's worth. <laughs> right. So this, uh, shift back to, uh, high, high value, uh, high budget materials and such. What, when can we expect to see some of the designs that you've come out with this year and over this past year start to come out in these higher, uh, forms? So I did the Indiegogo campaign for, um, 
the Oni XL and the Gin XL. Those were available in titanium as titanium frame locks with S35 VN. Mm-hmm. Now, in my opinion, S35 VN is you know is quite a good steel and on the upper end of the spectrum. Um, those land in a few days. Uh, and then they'll go out to everyone who pre-ordered them, and then you know they'll cool. be available. Also, the the phone, the eight knives that I released this year are on pre-order at the moment, and they are also available with titanium scales and S thirty five VN. So you know, I am I am listening to what people want, and there are people who want the, those higher end, but I'm not going to do M three ninety for a little while. I'm going to cap myself at S35 VN just because of the experience I had in the past. And also, I'm releasing eight models, eight knives with eight variations each. That's 64 variations. Holy mackerel. Yeah, that is a lot of of knives to... to put out. So, yeah, it's a... you're a nomad. Where where do you keep all these things? These knives come in... so Anthony, he has a YouTube channel called Tactical Everyday Dad. Mm-hmm. Uh, Anthony ships and stores and ships my products for me at oh, the moment. Okay, yeah. okay. that's cool. Uh, Is it like it's none of your business, Bob? <laughs> oh, okay. No, no, no. It's fine. No, but- he he lives in Michigan and he ships he ships my products um, out for me. Yeah. Uh, another- he's an- Sorry, go on. No, please go ahead. No, I said because he's a knife guy, I could go with the fulfillment company that, you know, yeah. receives the products. I could go with Amazon fulfillment, send them the product, and they take care of everything. But because Anthony is a, is a knife guy and he's a stay-at-home dad too, too he just had a he just had another baby. So, you know, he, he has the time, but he's also passionate about knives. He's also releasing his own uh, fixed blade soon. So so it's a perfect, it's a perfect fit. He, he flew out to long beach and helped me out at the show. We had a great time. So yeah, he handles uh, the fulfillment aspect for me. What, uh, well, that's, it's good to have a friend like that. That's for sure. And, and it's also cool to hear that he is coming out with his own knife. There are a lot of YouTube um, knife guys that I know who are coming out with their own knives, have come out with their own knives, are in prototyping. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that's really cool. Even if you don't end up making a business out of it, to yeah. sort of to sort of mark your passion for for knife collecting or for knives and with with a passion project like that is pretty cool i someday i will do that for sure someday when i come across that briefcase full of cash and and uh, (laughs) and some cad knowledge (laughs) i will definitely do that um what can we expect what can we look for from damn designs uh in in the future here all right so other than the eight knives that i mentioned that are in production now um and the Oni XL and Gin XL that land right now. There's four new minis that I also did on Indiegogo. So the Oni, which is my first fifth pocket knife, I redesigned the handles a bit and released three new uh, blade shapes with it. Um, other than that, I have a few. There's this uh, collab with Kaiser that's coming out hopefully soon. Um, this well, is a that is a nice. Play. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, so. Nick Shabazz actually looked at this edge and he was just shocked as to how thin it got behind the nice. behind the edge. And he was like, you know, I like thin edges, but this is something else. So they they prototyped this, and I must say they took I licensed the design out to them in June last year, and they took a long time. They took a year to prototype this, which again is isn't ideal, but um I'll cut them some slack because they're still working on it. Uh, but we, what we're doing with this is we're changing it to a thumb stud and a backlock because I don't have any backlocks and oh, cool. you know we're gonna we're gonna try we're gonna try that we're gonna make it a backlock and hope this is one of the things that I'm excited about because uh, Kaiser does good work also and they've done, they've done quite a good job with this knife. Now, other than this, I have a few unreleased designs that I will you know release soon. There's the fixed place that's coming out and then. Nice. You know, you post something on Instagram and someone goes, oh, you know, the Wendigo will make a great fixed blade or, you know, this <laughs> knife will make a great fixed blade, you know, but yeah. how much can one person do? Yeah. I'll it's get like, right on it. <laughs> yeah. The, these eight knives are clo- over $150,000 in production. You know, 
it's yeah, huge man. and i'm just a single guy no investors i don't have that kind of money so i do pre-orders to you know try and get some things going put the deposit down and figure out the rest later so yeah it's it's tough but you know i'm i'm getting there i'll get there oh, so man. yeah this is these are the current plans on the knife front i have uh, i have plenty of designs at the moment that i can i have to release before i start designing new stuff yeah yeah, it really, uh, from from our perspective, my perspective, seems like you're killing it. And, you know, there's no worse thing than someone who's got the energy you have, uh, but not the imagination, you know, and the, and the constant right. designs coming up. You have those designs that bubble up and the ones that you refine and the ones that you work on, you become responsible to those designs to do something with them, either have them made or, or, or give it your best try. Right. And um, I, I love what you're doing, and I can't wait to to see where it goes. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Well, thank you so much, Adrian, for coming on the Knife Junkie thank Podcast. You. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. All righty, sir. Take care. Thank you. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. There he goes, Adrian D'Souza of Damned Designs. Uh, really like his work. And if you don't believe me, check out the four videos I have of his uh, recent four knives uh, up on my YouTube channel, uh, the Knife Junkie YouTube channel. It's of the Cerberus, the Fenrir, the Hades, and the Invictus. All really cool. And uh, yeah, so check out those close-up videos. Also, check out Wednesday's supplemental uh, podcast, also Thursday Night Knives, our live stream at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And of course, join us back here next Sunday for another great interview. Uh, until then, thanks to Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.